I'm Chris Beyer. I'm the executive producer at Inc. Magazine. I'm here with Simon Sinek, a unshakable optimist and inspirational speaker. Thank you for your time. Thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. So let me ask you a broad question before we get into the nitty gritty. Why are you an optimist? Why do you choose to see the world that way? I, I mean, I don't know if optimists choose to see that way. I think well, I guess you can choose to be an optimist. It is, a, it is a point of view that you can take, right? You can look for everything bad in the world and think the world is crashing and it'll never get better. Or you can choose to see the good in people and choose to see the good in the world, and then that's the direction that, that will follow. Um, and, um, you know, I, 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 I tend to believe that th there's no finality in anything. You know, it's not like, uh, you know, you're, even though we, our lives are finite, life is infinite. You know, life goes on. and, and for me, the goal is not to produce something that has an endpoint, but to produce something that has momentum that can live on beyond me. And so I, I choose an optimistic path. Where did you go to college? I went to Brandeis University just outside of uh, Boston. Did you go to grad school? I have half a law degree. <laughs> I, yeah, right, right. <laughs> I dropped out I of law. That, yes. I dropped out of law school. What, yeah. what, what prompted you to drop out? It's not for me. And I knew that it wasn't for me. Yeah. Um, you knew that it wasn't for you before you even went to law school? No, no, I wanted to go. Yeah. Um, but once I was there, I realized it wasn't for me. And I figured, why waste the time? Yeah. So when you, when you dropped out of law school and went into the real world, so to speak, what, what were the jobs that you were holding before you went off and started your own thing? I was living in England. I went to law school in England. Mm -hmm. And I not only made the decision to drop out of law school, I also made the decision to move back to the United States. Um, and I happened to be dating uh, a girl who was studying advertising ah. um, a, at Syracuse. And so she got this idea, this bug in my ear about advertising, where I could do business and creative stuff all at the same time. Interesting. And so I made the decision to go into advertising, to go into marketing. And so uh, my career started immediately. I started looking for jobs in advertising, and I started in ad agencies. So most of your wisdom is about how to better live in this corporate world. Yeah. How did the corporate world suit you? You know, I, I was still an entrepreneurial. I think people misunderstand what the word entrepreneur means. Mm -hmm. You know, um, uh, small business owners own small businesses, and entrepreneurs solve problems. And there are many, many entrepreneurs inside corporations. Yeah. Um, and not all small business owners are entrepreneurs. I see. Um, uh, so an entrepreneur is somebody who's constantly looking for a better way to do something. There, there's, a, there's a sort of a, a mad scientist about them. Um, it's not simply you know, understanding structure and building business. Um, and, and that's the way I was in the corporate world, which, you know, depending on my boss, was either uh, welcomed or, or not. Oh, yeah. I, you know, I used to get in trouble for that's not how we do it around here. And really? Like, did I break any rules? They're like, no. I'm like, did I get it done? They're like, yes. I'm like, did I get it done better than you expected? They're like, yes. I'm like, so what exactly is the problem? <laughs> You know, so I was that, yeah, I was, yeah. but I had good relationships. I was very lucky. I had some, some not so great bosses at the beginning of my career, uh, which was actually great because I, I learned, I learned about the camaraderie of a team. Mm -hmm. um, but I had some fantastic bosses um, middle and later on in my career, which was really great. Um, and a lot of who I've become as a leader is very much, was very much shaped by those people. When did you start developing that first philosophy that you were known for, the golden circle, the concept of the golden circle? When did that realization start to happen? So I quit the ad business and started my own marketing firm. Already? Mm -hmm. In 2002. And throughout my entire career, uh, I was always fascinated why some advertising or some marketing worked and some didn't. Uh -huh. And Because having been on the inside, I knew that I could have a brilliant team and we could come up with amazing creative ideas and it would fail, or I could have a, the same team on a different thing who would come up with equally good ideas and it would succeed. Mm -hmm. And so I, would, I looked at the great marketers, the ones that we admired and the ones that I've written about, you know, your Southwest Airlines, your Apples, yeah. the ones that are you know, sort of the perennial favorites. Yeah. And uh, I recognized that there was a pattern in the way in which they spoke to us. Like I literally could look at their ads and like see that there was an organization um, and I wrote it down, and even back then I called it the Golden Circle. Um, and when I when I had my own business, I would use, it was just basically in PowerPoints to explain why some marketing worked and some marketing didn't. It wasn't when you were first talking to a yeah, client. Mm -hmm. It wasn't a big idea yeah. yet. It was simply a, an organizing principle: how to organize information for marketing. As it turns out, 
there's a pattern. As it turns out, all the great and inspiring leaders and organizations in the world, whether it's Apple or Martin Luther King or the Wright brothers, they all think, act, and communicate the exact same way, and it's the complete opposite to everyone else. So was it you then that decided, I want to share this with, with as many people as I can, regardless of clients from my, from my advertising agency? Or were people reaching out and saying, hey, can you talk about this outside of your work? It, it's um, like so many of these stories. It sounds like you know, I was a genius, but it was much more evolutionary than revolutionary, uh -huh. much more organic. What, I, I was fascinated by this idea, and it had a profound impact on my own life um, and my own view of the world. And like anybody, when you read a great book or you see a great movie, you tell your friends to read it or see it. And, and so I would talk about this thing obsessively because it, it was like, it was, you know, it's Couldn't like, shut it's, up it's like when you find a new song and all you do is listen to that one oh, song. Oh, I've been there. It's the same, I, it's the same thing, you know, yeah. it's just this obsession for this one thing. The difference is um, it didn't lose steam and my friends were taking it to heart and were making crazy life changes. Like I had friends really? quitting jobs and starting businesses once they heard this thing. Because of a talk you had with them at a bar. Yeah, or yeah, and, wow. and and I figured out how to help people find their why, and I would I and my friends would invite me to their homes to share it with their friends. So it all started with me standing in somebody's living room, really, in New York City, like you know, with one of those those prepared platters that you get at the at the supermarket with the celery and the carrots, mm -hmm. and, you know, like one of those in the middle of the room, and I would talk about the thing called the why, and people would ask me to help them find their one. I used to do it for a hundred bucks on the side. It was extremely organic, you know. I kept I talked about it everywhere I went. People would tell people about it. People would ask me to come talk about it. And um, somebody invited me to come give a talk to a bunch of entrepreneurs. And I said, yes. Wow. Yeah. So what happened when, when you gave my that first, first real talk? talk. Yeah. Your, your first real talk. Yeah. Were you like, oh my, I should, maybe this shouldn't just be the side gig? Um, I didn't know that being a speaker was actually a thing, uh, weirdly. Um, so when and they, this is, we're talking 2000-ish? So I started giving these talks in 2006 because it was my own discovery of my own why that really generated the passion for this idea. And what was your own why? Uh, to inspire people to do what inspires them so together each of us can change our world for the better, which continues to be my passion and my drive. And that has not changed. It, one, you only have one why your whole life. Yeah. And the opportunity is to live in balance or out of balance with that, with that why. I see. Um, it's not created in the middle of your life. It's created early in your life. And if you can figure out what it is, you can choose to make decisions to, to, to bring that why to life, and that's, that's what I've done. As we're here in this sort of 2006, 2007 area, you have your marketing firm, mm -hmm. and you're doing this consultation work, t uh, teaching people how to find their why. Mm -hmm. When did you sort of stop doing the more traditional marketing stuff and just really focus on, this is what I'm doing? Uh, probably a year-ish after that. Mm -hmm. It wasn't, it was relatively quickly when I realized I wanted to only do, spread this message of the why. Yeah. Wasn't sure exactly what form it would take, I just knew I wanted to do it. And so, managed to back out of my lease, by back out and I'd pay a fine. Oh my. <laughs> uh, I got out of my lease from my office. Yeah. Um, and started from scratch. Because I wanted to, I, I had this sort of very scientific approach which is, scientific method, which is I, I had a theory, uh -huh. and I wanted to prove the theory, and the best way to prove the theory was to start clean. Yeah. Um, um, and, and I didn't think I was right, I just think, thought I had an idea, and I wanted to test it until it would fail, and then I would tweak the idea. And so I kept looking for new opportunities, big companies, small companies, different industries, public companies, private companies, government, military, I just was looking for all the different places that I could try it, waiting for it to fail and it kept working. Wow. And so it really, it was really an amazing experience to see this theory just keep working. But I, I kept, the reason, and I was very honest. I was very honest with people. they like, have you worked in, you know, politics before? I'm like, nope, never done it, but, yeah. but I want to give it a try and see if this works. Uh, it may not, but I was always very honest about what my pursuits were. Yeah. And people, again, the early adopters said, well, let's give it a try. So everybody went in with open eyes, me and my clients. So you continue to do this, and you continue to spread this message, and, and it kept working. Tell me how you got that TED Talk in 2009. Well, as, um, you know, I became a champion for this message and a champion for this cause, mm -hmm. and it was, um, and so when you talk about what you believe, people who believe what you believe um, recommend you or want to introduce you to people. I see. And so um, the more I talked about it, the more somebody would call me and say, hey, this is someone I think you should meet. Yeah. And people 
found me. I don't know, you know, from somebody else. So you did not seek out, I no. want to do this for, no. okay, yeah. No, no, so somebody, somebody reached out to me and said, we're doing, you know, they got my name. Yeah. And they said, we've heard about you, we've heard your work. Uh, we'd like to invite you to do a TEDx talk in Puget Sound in Seattle. Yeah. And I said, okay, sounds amazing. You know, TEDx was a, um, they were, it was a relatively new thing back then and it was a big deal, you know. It still had a lot of real sort of, in, you know, gravitas to it. And so I was very excited and of course, of course said yes to the opportunity. This little idea explains why some organizations and some leaders are able to inspire where others aren't. Let me define the terms really quickly. Every single person, every single organization on the planet knows what they do, 100%. Some know how they do it, whether you call it your differentiating value proposition or your proprietary process or your USP. But very, very few people or organizations know why they do what they do. There was a talk I'd been giving for three years already. This was in 2009. I'd been giving this talk for three years. I knew yeah. my stuff inside and out. And so um, I showed up to give the best talk I could in 18 minutes. For me, the challenge was the 18 minutes, mm -hmm. not the talk. How long is the talk normally? Oh, it was like an hour, or an hour and a half. <laughs> yeah. you know? I, was, and I was like, I had no idea how to do it in 18 minutes. Um, and, uh, but I just gave the best talk I could, and they put it on YouTube, and I didn't expect it to get as many views as it did on YouTube, and it did. And in a few months, the TED people put it on mainted.com, and then things went silly. Wow. Define things went silly. Uh, it went from hundreds of thousands of views to millions of views. And what happened? Were you ready for the wave to hit? Did you know where you wanted the wave to take you? Definitely wasn't ready for it because t everything was a surprise to me. I only found out that they put it on TED.com the week it happened. Mm -hmm. Like there was no advance notice. They didn't ask permission. It was like they just did it, and I found out about it. Yeah. Um, I didn't know what it would do. It was again. I was out spreading a message, and it was wonderful for me to have a yet another medium to help me spread this message so I didn't have to be in the room all the time. Yeah. Um, what I didn't expect is it would create more demand for me as a speaker. I didn't, and, and I never set myself on this course to be a public speaker. It was, it's not really a chosen profession. Um, you know, if I never give another speech again, I'd be fine with that. I do it because I believe in the message and I think it's important to go and preach that message. I see. Um, and the, what the TED Talk gave me was the opportunity to, to, to spread that message um, at vastly greater scale, you know, much bigger audiences. Yeah. Um, and that's, that's been a great honor. Did you ever have moments where you thought, wow, so many people are listening to me, I hope. Moments of imposter syndrome, moments where you doubted yourself? I think, I, would, I wouldn't call it imposter syndrome. I, I was more humbled by the whole thing. You know, I would catch myself laughing and giggling at myself, at, at, like, I can't believe that they let me in here. Yeah. You know? Like, that happened more frequently. I wouldn't call I it see. imposter. I'm, mm -hmm. It was more like, I think they're idiots because they don't really know that I'm an idiot. You know, it's, it's uh -huh. kind of like Groucho Marx who said, I would never join a club that would have, have me as a member. It was a little bit of that, you know? It's like, what's wrong with these people that they think that, you know, it's like, that, that was the only sort of impostery thing that, that crept in. It was, Do you still have that? Um, I, yeah, I do. I, I'm sort of, I still, I'm sort of amazed by it all, you know, and I'm, I'm, there's a, you know, like when I meet people who I know, uh, there's an author or, or a, a oh, I see. celebrity Some, or somebody ah, that yes. I, who I know, yeah. like I know your work, yeah. you know my work, you know, yeah. that, that's, it's, it's, it's humbling. It's, it's uh, like people who, whose books I used to read, you know, when I was in the marketing business, like, like I, they're friends now, like that's weird to me. Like, yeah. like that's, uh, that's very humbling. Was there any sort of larger flaw that you had to confront about yourself, whether as a leader or just as a human over these last 10 years and rising success? Uh, there's many. Mm -hmm. um, the biggest lesson I learned was, thank goodness I learned it pretty early on, which is, and I think a lot of business owners make this mistake, um, which is uh, because I was the boss, you know, in my own mind, yeah. um, uh, I thought I had to know all the answers. And if I didn't, I thought I had to pretend that I did. And uh, that's stupid. Um, and what I learned is that just because I may have the, the top position in the hierarchy, I, I, I'm not expected to know everything. And if I pretend to know everything, it diminishes the value of all the great ideas and the great intelligence around me. And when, when things got difficult, I would never admit it. Right? I would just put on a brave face and show up every day. And um, and the, the, the biggest lesson I learned was to say, I don't know, I don't understand, or I need help. 
um, at, at any level about any subject. Yeah. And amazingly, I was always surrounded by people who wanted to help or who knew answers, but they never offered to help or offer the answers because they didn't think I needed it because I kept pretending that I knew it all. Right. Not to mention the fact that nobody likes a know-it-all. Um, so that was huge for me. And, and when I was willing to ask for help and accept it when it was offered and, and sort of accept the humility of the fact that other people know a lot more about a lot of things than I know. Uh -huh. I know one thing, you know, and they know lots of things. Um, uh, that's when things really started to move because we were now a team. Like we were actually working together.